It's a long, sad story, Mr. Smith. You wouldn't be interested. Oh, but I would. I would indeed. You see, you are the reason that I've journeyed to Dansburg. You must be a creditor. <laughs> no, not yet, anyhow. Now, the fact is, I'm a newspaper man. I was hoping to secure a position with your paper. And welcome to the seventh episode of The Twilight Pwn, a podcast that discusses each and every episode of The Twilight Zone. My name is John, and I am joined by my co-host, Fred. Hello. And today we are going to be discussing a listener-requested episode, Printer's Devil. It's the 111th episode of the show, and it aired on February 28th, 1963. Take away a man's dream, fill him with whiskey and despair. Send him to a lonely bridge. Let him stand there all by himself, looking down at the black water. And try to imagine the thoughts that are in his mind. You can't, I can't. But there's someone who can. And that someone is seated next to Douglas Winter right now. The car is headed back toward town. But its real destination is the Twilight Zone. Kind of sounds like Denton on Doomsday there. Got like a vaguely Western score and Rod Serling is like, a loser filled with whiskey. You know? <laughs> the musical score took a lot of turns in this one. Yeah, We've exactly. Got a, different, a lot of different choices yeah, there. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get to it. So we like to write our own Serling style introductions to each of these episodes after we've watched them. Do you want to go first, John, or do you want me to go? I'll go ahead and go first. Okay. In the 15th century, Johannes Gutenberg perfected movable type and brought the Gutenberg Bible to the masses. In the centuries that followed, man has seen the spread of knowledge and the growth of industry. But what do we really know about movable type? Is it a mere tool for the transmissions of ideas? Or is it a perhaps a tool for some darker purpose? Like a devil who writes newspaper <laughs> articles about bad stuff and it comes true. That could happen in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> I'm impressed because I knew that you only wrote that five minutes ago. <laughs> it's got all these... Clearly you spent some time on Wikipedia to write that one. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I understood. Okay, here's mine. Picture of a struggling newspaperman who makes a deal with Rupert Murdoch, I mean the devil, to save his tepid tabloid. His circulation goes up, but his soul is going down. Unless, in the exhilarating nail-blighting conclusion to this episode... He can properly operate a linotype machine. <laughs> extra, extra, read all about the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Very good. All right. Very good. If by chance you haven't already seen this episode, there'll be a lot of spoilers. And all the episodes generally are available on Netflix. Uh, most of them are also available on Hulu. And the fourth season, not on Netflix, but you can watch it for free on your computer on Hulu. Well, the fourth season episodes are all an hour long because The Twilight Zone was actually canceled at the end of its third season and sort of then rescued last minute by CBS to, I think, fill a slot occupied by another show called, like, Nurses or something. Like, <laughs> Nurses 911, which was an hour long. And so uh, they, you know, goosed the length of the Twilight Zone to a full hour with, you know, mixed results. <laughs> right. Uh, in case you're not familiar with Printer's Devil, you've got this guy who owns a small-town newspaper called the Dansburg Courier. His name is Douglas Winter. Uh, his newspaper's not doing too well. His bills are piling up. He meets a strange man who is the devil, obviously, given the title of the episode, who uh, turns the fate of the newspaper around, but not as all as it seems. And unsurprisingly, Wait. given that he made a deal with the devil, things go bad. Rarely works out. Yeah, surprisingly. It's shocking. <laughs> Clearly, everything has to have... Uh, some kind of popular media about the devil interfering with it. It's kind of like there's not like one profession that doesn't have some story about the devil <laughs> intervening. Oh, that reminds us, uh, me. We just got our first sponsor that oh, we're yeah. very excited to welcome, Beelzebub Soda. Yeah. And I think it's going to get our podcast out into the world. And I think yeah. that's the only important thing. No, no the yeah. Damn no. the consequences. Yeah. You were on the verge of committing suicide because we <laughs> were stalling, <laughs> st stalling out at 30 Twitter followers. <laughs> So Dougie is, is that the paper? It's an interesting thing that you pointed out in last episode, how good Serling is at setting up story in a, in a short amount of time. Yeah. I think this is probably indicative of the fourth season. It's pretty bad about taking a long time to say not much. It's very clear there's a lot of padding. I like how, like, you know, they try and show that the paper's not doing so well. Like, he's going through all these bills on 
He's trying to find all this stuff on his desk. He pulls his broken cigarette out of his desk. And then he, like, can't even light the cigarette without falling over. (laughs) Which is kind of like a very weird extreme way to show what a loser this guy is. It's revealed in the beginning of of the episode that this newspaper, the Dansburg Courier, is operating with, like, what, three people? They've got the publisher, they've got a girlfriend who's on staff, and then they've got this, like old linotype operator who can't even speak without taking a shot of bourbon so it's it's not not too shocking that their newspaper is not doing so well the uh girlfriend slash perhaps reporter yeah it's never clear never clear (laughs) yeah she comes in and she sees that uh doug is down on his luck and she calls him right out on it yeah come on now doug things aren't that bad don't be such an old gloom (laughs) I am not now, nor have I ever been a gloom cookie. <laughs> I demand that you retract that statement vis-a-vis my gloom cookiness. I know, like, during the winter sometimes I can be a real gloom cookie. Oh, sure. Just... Yeah, with uh, depression depression chips yes. and uh, right. <laughs> walnuts of despair. Gloom cookie was actually the least popular Girl Scout cookie yeah. for many years. <laughs> That's true. Oh, boy. Anyway, All so right. after uh, Douglas Winter uh, rejects wholesale the notion of his his gloom cookie status uh they discuss how the business isn't going so well the linotype operator this uh old grandfatherly type who it must be said is not the best actor uh ever comes in and uh gets a shot of bourbon and announces he's leaving to go to the um competition which is um what's called the the gazette so there's a there's a competing newspaper syndicate in town called the gazette uh that's uh beating the the courier the linotype operator gives his notice. Mr. Winter, I, I hate to have to tell you this, but I'm resigning. I mean, I, I know it ain't your fault, but it's, it's eight weeks since I've been paid. Oh, I, I understand. I really hate to do it, Mr. Winter, but a man's got to eat. And I don't know for you if that if that brought any associations, but hang on, let me just let me play that clip for you one more time. Mr. Winter, I, I hate to have to tell you this, but I'm resigning. I mean, I, I know it ain't your fault, but it's. It's eight weeks since I've been paid. Oh, I, I understand. I really hate to do it, Mr. Winter, but... Men have to eat and work! <laughs> and you can't pack them in cosmoline like surplus tanks! Or put them out to pasture like old bulls! I'm a man! Mr. Winter... You hear me? I'm a man! <laughs> Oh, God. I like how you went to the trouble to make that clip, but you didn't write your intro until 30 seconds before we started the podcast. Priorities. I understand. Always priorities. So he leaves, and uh, then Douglas Winner is going going back into his uh, office, and he's looking at the two papers. He's looking at his own paper in comparison with the uh, Gazette. And the Gazette kind of looks more like the New York Post. You know, it's got, like, a lot right. of pictures, looks flashier. They're covering the same story, something about, like, the mayor's daughter, but, you know, the... The Gazette has all these like fancy pictures, and it's like you know, buff all box office with the dame and the scandal. <laughs> and the, the Gazette, uh, the Courier, looks kind of more like the New Yorker or something. So he's he's distraught and uh, leaves the office, and um, kind of quickly jumps to suicide. <laughs> it's sort of weird, right. you know what I mean? It's kind of like the, the emotional tone of the episode is like, oh, things aren't going so well, and then he's just like, well, better kill myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he drives out to this bridge. Uh, it's a foggy night. He drives out to this bridge, and uh, he's drinking, and he's contemplating jumping in. It's got a very It's a Wonderful Life feel to it. Yeah. He's about to jump over this wall into this river, but he's stopped by um, Burgess Meredith, who appears out of the fog, dressed in sort of this quizzical little hound's tooth jacket. And uh, Burgess asks him for a light for a cigarette just at the right moment. They have a little conversation. Doug is still depressed, but um, Burgess reveals that he needs a ride back into town, which, uh, you know, prevents Doug from committing suicide. You know, there's a little moment where Doug's sort of going to go get his car to give this guy a ride, and, uh, you know, he's got a cigar that he's asked for a light for, and he says, oh, never mind, I actually have got my own light. And he snaps his fingers, and this little flame appears out of his finger, and so, you know, he's the devil. It's it's revealed pretty early <laughs> on. Well, I did think that special effect was kind of cool, actually. The way they did it was Burgess Meredith dunked his hand in 
a tub of ice water until his hand was freezing and then they dunked it in lighter fluid and there was like a little rig with some wires that were connected and so when he snapped the two wires touched off a spark and lit the lighter fluid on fire which struck right. me as something that they would like never put an actor through now like <laughs> they would just add it with like some crappy adobe after effects little thing they're driving back into town together and then we get serling's intro this is kind of, it's interesting because they're like 15 minutes into the episode before we hear serling i was kind of i don't know if you were bummed too but like normally when serling you know, steps out to give the intro, he's in the same room as the characters or whatever. I was kind of hoping he would come out of the fog to to give it, but they just cut and he's in the studio. I think Serling left to go teach at Antioch College oh, around right. this time. Every now and again, he would fly into L.A., They'd put him in a studio and just have mm-hmm. him record a bunch of the intros all at once. So they go to this bar where, for some reason, all the cocktail waitresses dress like they work at McDonald's uh, and uh, sit down and discuss Winters' woes with his paper. There's what I would, if it had been done once or twice, would say is like subtly yeah. foreshadowing, <laughs> but they do it over and over. Oh, again. yeah. They, they, the, they love that stuff on the Twilight Zone. Like whenever the devil comes up and the people in the episode don't know he's the devil, there's just all this winking and nodding at the, uh, at the <laughs> audience. Like, yeah, Winters is like, you must be a creditor. And the devil's like, not yet, I'm not. You know? <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> there's an episode. Uh, Earlier, I think in like season one or something called A Nice Place to Visit, where there's a guy who's in hell who, who thinks he's in heaven, but there's something like he's he's gambling and the gambling's going really well, and he's like, "Man, I'm hot tonight!" And the devil turns <laughs> to him, he's like, "You sure are!" Like, it's just, <laughs> they love that stuff. But he's kind of leering and lecherous towards the waitress. Yeah, keep it, my dears, in payment for your lovely smile. Thank you, sir. Mm. She moves fast for a big one. <laughs> Which, I like how the devil's just like a low budget horn dog. Burgess wants a job at the paper. Who'd come and they go to the office, and Burgess says he can run a linotype machine. Yeah. And there's a just spellbinding scene <laughs> yeah. where he does use the linotype machine very quickly. Yes, it's really for the impressive. average person. <laughs> For the average person who's never seen a person operate a linotype machine, we have no frame of reference if that's fast or slow. But we, but it seems it seems fast, and we know that he's doing well because he has this ridiculous face when he's yeah. when he's operating it. It's kind of like you know how some drummers get like drummer face when they're playing. Right. Like Mr. Smith has real linotype operator face when he's getting right. that thing going. As, as if that's not enough, he also offers to bail the paper out of its uh, debts that it's in. Well, if he'd made that offer ten minutes ago, I'd have thought he was kidding or crazy, but now, I I don't know. I mean, what's in it for him? Beats me. But I'm going to give it a go. Yeah, but there's something... A chance to stay in business. After all, what have I got to lose? That's right. What have you got to lose? (laughs) (laughs) His headlines generally are only of terrible things which makes sense the whole if it bleeds it leads yeah but he has a weird ability to get these headlines very quick we may have jumped over this but uh you know mr smith is not only a linotype operator but he's also a reporter so he's he's under the you know he's working for the courier he's running around getting stories and the first story that he brings in uh he brings in right after it happens and it's a bank robbery is that right i believe so yeah um and And uh, no, go on. Then his next big uh, his next big break was that a high school principal was at bigamist. Well, the devil is talking to Mr. Winters, and he's like, "You like this bigamy story, don't you?" And Doug Winters is like, "I love this story." You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Definitely. I also love how the the girlfriend you know is like, "I don't believe it," and she runs out of the room and like makes a phone call on the devil. And Mr. <laughs> right. Winters are talking back, and she comes back in, and she's like. That was the high school principal. He just confirmed it. Like, right. what did she do? Just call him and was like, hey, are you a bigamist? And he's like, yep, <laughs> sure yeah. am. Clearly, they're getting more business. And yeah. after two weeks, Doug makes the comment that our circulation has tripled. You got the impression at the beginning of the episode that their circulation had basically stopped. Yeah. So <laughs> we got nine people. <laughs> yeah. Now we got 27. We're back. <laughs> yeah. I'm sensing a connection between the career and our podcast, actually. (laughs) Very quickly after that, the head of the Gazette appears and offers to buy out Douglas. He rejects the Gazette's offer to buy the paper out. They're going to rehire some more people now that they have money. They're going to rehire the old 
uh, incompetent line of type operator <laughs> they had before. And yeah. Burgess Meredith, the uh, devil, shoots it down saying, I've, I've made some modifications to, to this line of type machine. Uh, only I can use it. So you kind of get the sense that, you know, something magical going on there. I mean, you already right. know there is, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's more clearly spelled yet. out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it can't properly properly be called foreshadowing anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's just shadowing. Yeah. It's just trouble between the lovebirds, um, w- Winters and his you know employee who apparently works at the paper but doesn't do anything but complain. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a I don't know the relationship between them is really weakly sketched. You know she says something like, you know ever since the devil came on board you've really changed, Doug, and it's like. He hasn't really changed, you know? Like, no. she's sort of insinuating that he's, you know, evil now and that he's, I don't know, but I just, you don't really see it. He's the same bland white guy the entire episode. So it's like, well, you get the, yeah, what she's trying to insinuate, but it's like there hasn't been any real change in behavior on his part. So I guess the, the one thing you could point to is there's the shot of the courier at the beginning, and it's clear they're more of a like New York Times, New Yorker, like stately publication. Yeah. And, they're starting to run things like he got really excited about the idea of a headline about high school bigamy. Yeah, so. <laughs> which is kind of sad for a different reason. But yeah, right. Um. <laughs> the next story to be reported is that a fire has burned down the Gazette building. Right. And the owner of the Gazette assumes or suspects that Doug or one of his workers was involved because mm-hmm. he saw Burgess in the surrounding area at the time. That's not true. No, that's not why. He correct insinuates me. that, <laughs> correct me, reprimand me, uh, <laughs> give it to me, punish <laughs> me. Wait a minute. Are you trying to say that... I hate to tell you, but I'm afraid this time you pulled a bone. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it would be only a matter of time before that clip got pulled out. <laughs> Uh, we really do need a Howard Stern-esque sound effects guy just to play that clip. Right. Uh, I think I'll save that one. The, the guy from the Gazette is coming over and he's accusing Winters of um, starting the fire just because the headline came out so soon after the paper, after the building burned down. It's not because he saw Mr. Smith oh, he lurking doesn't? around. He doesn't say that. He just insinuates it just because the scoop came out so quickly. Now Doug is starting to suspect maybe something's up with Mr. Smith because he's bringing all these scoops right after they happen. But now he's taken it even further and he reports on a story just before it happens. Yeah, one thing I thought was really weak is that like, you know, in a normal you'd think for a story like this the stories would slowly escalate in terms of importance or you know drama but it's like the last story was a big fire that broke out and then this next scene that really you know turns the plot around is like a guy won a sweepstakes you know it's right. like kind of like isn't that a step back from a building burning down but yeah and that's actually a good like most of the stories have been kind of bad yeah. things which make you think oh the devil is Getting to go after this one guy while getting to cause mischief all around. Yeah. But he let a guy win, win a sweepstakes. That's kind of nice. I don't know. Maybe the guy but, used the sweepstakes for evil or something yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> it was like the monkey's paw of sweepstakes. Yeah, totally. Weird little moment uh, where, like, you know, Doug is going into his office to confirm this story about this mm-hmm. guy winning the sweepstakes. And then you see, like, in a sort of special effect, like Burgess Meredith, like, ghost comes into the room and sort of spies on him like there's a glass dividing his office from the main area and burgess comes to look at him we see his reflection in the glass hovering over doug oh really i I thought it was supposed to be like some sort of weird supernatural thing like the devil's kind of like spying on him making the phone call i hope that's not what happened but i thought it (laughs) because that would be much stupider i thought it was just kind of a cool shot doug comes out and he lets the devil know because he called the sweepstakes guy to you know confirm the story and it turns out that it hadn't quite happened yet the guy hadn't won the sweepstakes yet he gives the devil his due and tells him i hate to tell you but i'm afraid this time you pulled a boner (laughs) <laughs> we got we got no joke on that one that one just stands let, just let it let it simmer let it marinate yeah <laughs> think about that one guys think about it it turns out the devil has in fact not pulled not a boner pulled a bo- <laughs> um, whatever the opposite of that might be yeah the devil's uh i got nope. it. i don't want to nope. i don't want to go is, there it's a clean podcast fred keep please it, keep it pg um it's time it's time for the devil to kind of like fully come out of the closet as being the devil he's been insinuating it as i've been saying right. it as loud and clear as i can leaving little hints around the office that i'm the devil but it's time right. to really really talk it out with doug and explain the deal this part is somewhat clever the way he makes the pitch for douglas's soul you don't really believe that i'm the devil do you no well then why don't you put it this way 
You're humoring me. After all, what good is the soul anyway? It's sort of like an appendix these days, particularly since it doesn't exist in the first place. Well, just for the sake of argument, why do you particularly want mine? Well, for the sake of argument, let's say I'm something of a connoisseur, and you have a very choice soul, and as the vintners say, it's a good year. Eventually, Burgess breaks down and finally just calls him chicken yeah. until he signs the <laughs> document. Yeah, I did. I don't know if you you thought this was funny, but I thought the like the document itself looked pretty crummy. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> it looks like it was printed out like in Microsoft Word, like a sole contract template. And we know for a fact he ha- knows his way around a linotype. I know. We know he could do better. Exactly. Yeah. There's there's actually like kind of a typo in it. There's like a he forgot to put a space between a period and a word, so it's kind of like a really shoddy document that probably wouldn't hold up in court. Dougie signs the uh, Microsoft Word sole contract. And Next, we get a little montage, and he's typing away at that uh, linotype like uh, Liberace, and we see a, a giant <laughs> a giant building getting destroyed. That's the first, you know, the next bit of bad news he creates. And then the next scene is he kills a couple on, who's, like, on a canoe, which, again, is a weird thing. It's like <laughs> he destroys a building full of people, and the next one is, like, two people drown, which admittedly is a tragedy, but still kind of weird. Then the next scene is he, a, a banker kills his wife, and, you know, so the devil's causing all these bad things to happen, and they're appearing in the paper. I did like the conceit of the devil's able to mess with this one guy, but he's also getting a good little venue to wreak havoc yeah. on a bunch of people yeah, while a, doing it, you know. Yeah, it's a twofer. It seemed like a good gig devil. for him. Yeah. yeah, it's a good job. I'm, I'm really happy the devil's in a good place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, his life was really a mess there for a while. His friends were worried. Like, I know. is he ever going to find his way, get on his feet again? I know. After he got kicked out of heaven, you know, there was a really long period in the wilderness. But, yeah. you know, the girlfriend is upset because bad news is happening. They sort of yeah. have it out. She slaps the devil, Mr. Smith, and he's, you know, that's one toke over the line for the devil. One toke over the line, sweet devil. Yeah. Even Doug has now come around to the fact that he wants the devil gone. Um, yeah, and he started to become suspicious yeah. of this devil character. <laughs> I'm a little bit suspicious of you making me sign a contract away from my soul. I'm going to give you another year. This devil guy might not be on the level. <laughs> Finally, the devil just kind of ups and up and says, yeah, I'm the devil. Deal with it. Explaining that, you know, whatever he types on this machine comes true in real life. And the devil's like, well, if you want me gone, you can always make good on our contract. And he, he gives him a gun. So obviously Winters is supposed to kill himself if he doesn't do this that the devil's gonna uh, do away with the ambiguously employed girlfriend and he just kind of starts writing this article explaining that she's right. gonna get in a car crash that very evening winters is determined to you know save his girlfriend he he runs to her house they've pulled a boner and have missed each other in passing and so the woman offers to the devil you know she apologizes for slapping him he says something like wow well, you know i'll leave town right now if you give me a ride doug failing to find his girlfriend runs back to the the newspaper office and so he hits upon the idea of using the linotype machine to change the story or to write a new story there's a climactic crash but lo and behold the girl survives it and mr smith the devil disappears um and the the article that he wrote is kind of it's weird it got a lot of denouement and it's like the car crash didn't kill the girl and the devil left and the contract it was null and void it's like (laughs) it's kind of like pretty wishful thinking on his part Exit the infernal machine, and with it his satanic majesty, Lucifer, Prince of Darkness, otherwise known as Mr. Smith. He's gone, but not for good. That wouldn't be like him. He's gone for bad, and he might be back with another ticket to the twilight. I did like how it went from this sort of like, his satanic majesty, Lord Lucifer, will be leaving now, <laughs> to this like really shitty pun. Uh, trivia, a printer's devil was an apprentice in a printing establishment who performed kind of the menial tasks such as mixing tubs of ink and fetching type. In an interview, Burgess Meredith said that of all the episodes he did, he did four of them, he felt the most confident in this episode. This episode had very <laughs> classic themes. It was very Faustian. Sure, yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is the one that really is, has lasted, stood the test of time. From an actor's perspective, it yeah. was definitely the most fun for him, the most to chew on. Oh, for sure. Of his appearances on The Twilight Zone, I think this is far and away my favorite performance that he gives. You know, the other episodes that he's in are, he's in Time Enough at Last, which is the classic one about the guy whose glasses break in the apocalypse. 
And there's right. he's in this really stupid comedy episode called Mr. Dingle the Strong, which is really bad. I'm looking forward to doing that one. Then he's also in The Obsolete Man, which is like a, a good episode, kind of a, a more serious-minded one. But he always plays like a very meek, timid character. And I think that like, you know, giving him a chance to really be, you know, this sleazy douchebag devil. The devil was a douchebag. <laughs> no, I, was just, I, did, I was mainly just talking about kind of like what a low rent horn dog he was. He really is yeah, just kind of yeah. like, it's like he's not really like out there like causing plagues and famines. He's just kind of like sexually harassing people. The director of this episode has a blog where he just like writes about his adventures in the in the film world and he, really? Yeah, he wrote a really long post about this, about the directing of this episode, and it's unfortunately didn't really yield any great trivia nuggets, but one thing that it did yield, which was that Burgess Meredith got really into like creating the role, and he chose his own costume for the episode. Not that the costume is right. so fascinating, but I, I, you just get the impression that like you know Burgess was like really into playing this character, and I, you can see why. He takes a lot of delight in the role. There was a horror anthology from the 80s called Tales from the Dark Side that also had an episode entitled Printer's Devil. Yeah. I sent you a link to that. Did you happen to watch it? I did not watch it, no. I'm sad, uh, I'm, I'm sad to say. Check out our Tales from the Dark Side podcast. Right, coming soon. Tales from the Dark Pone. That one involved an author who wanted to make it big. And he oh, makes yeah. a deal with the devil yeah. where he has to sacrifice animals. And then his short story will make it into like McSweeney's or whatever. <laughs> right. Just, <laughs> right. Well, that is how Dave Eggers got popular. The other bios, um, Robert Sterling played Douglas Winter. Interestingly, his IMDb bio compared him to Gig Young yeah. in both looks and roles. Yeah, but he didn't. He didn't quite have the success. He's like kind of an anonymous, handsome, late fifties, early sixties white person. So he, he right. he's got that in common with Gig Young. But the Doug Winters character just was not not a great character. But he didn't do a good job at it. I think he was it no. was a pretty like bland performance. Speaking of the anonymous 50s, 60s white guy, yeah. I've had it happen with multiple episodes where I immediately think, oh, it's that one juror from 12 Angry Men, the businessman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never him. It's just there were tons of men who looked exactly like that guy. Yeah. I wonder what it's going to be like in 30 years when people are looking back, the aughts right. and the teens. Like, who's who's the the person that everyone's going to think? Everyone of. looks like Robert Pattinson. Right. <laughs> everyone looks like Lena Dunham. Four years from now. She's such a type. The fascinating thing, I thought you'd like this for Robert Sterling. He kind of moved away from acting. Yeah. In the 70s, he start, got involved in the lucrative computer business, oh. which implemented one of the first supermarket barcoding and inventory systems. Oh, good stuff. So basically, he is Jerry Herndon. Yeah. <laughs> he quit acting, and he's like, I, I do computer supermarkets. It's great, Barbara. <laughs> yeah. That was a long time ago. Yeah, I wonder if he had like a reunion with like, the woman who plays his girlfriend, yeah. and she was horrified to see him. <laughs> his name, just I thought, was kind of funny to me, just like the sense that, you know, you got Rod Sir directing an actor named Rob Sterling. I just thought that, right. you know, a lot of crack-ups on set about that. I'm sure. <laughs> the woman who we I don't think we've named her once in our discussion. Yes. Her character name was Jackie Benson. Got it. Was played by Pat Crowley. The only interesting trivia I found was that both Pat Crowley and Rob Sterling, their most famous roles were TV shows in the 60s based on movies. Hmm. So... She was in a TV show in the 60s called Please Don't Eat the Daisies, which was based off a movie. And he was on a television show called Topper, huh. which sounded ridiculous and involved ghosts that he was a ghost. And he got into hijinks and harassed a living guy. <laughs> another, but it another, ran for two seasons. Another classic mid-60s ghost hijink show. I thought she was fine. I mean, she she tried a little bit harder than... Uh... Than old old Dougie Winters did. I don't even. What's his name? I can't even remember. You said it three minutes ago. Well, what's his name? Rob Sterling. <laughs> oh, right, uh, right. No one other than Burgess really stood out. Yeah. And as we said, Burgess Meredith, obviously, you've covered most of it. Twice Oscar nominated. Most famous for his role as Mickey in the Rocky movies, Penguin in the Batman television show, and for the younger viewers, for his role as Jack Lemmon's dad in Grumpy Old Men. Right. Well, he did a great job in this episode. I mean, he's yeah, like the main... definitely. He's the, he just clearly delights in the role, and he, really fun to watch. Definitely. Definitely yeah. a ton of fun. Slight MST3K connection. He appeared Inevitable in... MST3K connection. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. He appeared in one of the episodes that w aired on KTMA before the show moved to cable. Burgess Meredith an episode. Did? Yes, mm. in an episode called SST Death Flight. Uh -huh. But 
A little more solid one we have. Charles P. Tompkins yes. played the original Lionotype operator, yeah. and he was in Teenage Caveman as a member of the tribe. Yes, I saw that. I loved yep. the credit on IMDb is member of the tribe. This was our first non-Serling episode written by Charles Beaumont, who wrote over 20 episodes of The Twilight Zone All In. I imagine he did better work. You know, it's not a bad idea. It's yeah. not... Like, there's bad writing, there's just a lot of padding, and I think at half the length, it'd be twice as good. It was interesting to watch an episode not written by Sterling after having watched six that were... I had noticed it, just the way that the characters speak is very different, you know? There's like, there's not as many highfalutin vocabulary words, each sentence has fewer words in it. It was interesting to note, just like the, the change in style. So this episode was actually based on a short story Charles Beaumont wrote called The Devil You Say. It was his first published sale, and so he was able to retool it for this episode. Yeah. Directed by Ralph Sninsky, who keeps up a a blog apparently (laughs) he did a lot of television he has he has like a not like a wordpress page but he has like an angel fire page or something like that that like (laughs) what are those what was that old template that people used to make word pages on the internet was angel fire was another one too do you know what i'm talking about live journal no it was pre-live journal even it was back in the was the internet really so bad where (laughs) you come from fred (laughs) <laughs> Maybe they have live GeoCities. There that's too. what it was. It was GeoCities. <laughs> the music was yeah. a terrible hodgepodge mess. <laughs> yes, I enjoyed that. Some of it is like electronic. Some of it is like clearly right. cribbed from a Western show. Yeah. <laughs> hey, how'd he get that article written so fast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Over and over. And then when they got kind of bored of playing that, suddenly you'd hear. Yeah. It's clearly the composer just like slamming his hand down on his synthesizer. (laughs) Obviously, Burgess Meredith was a ton of fun playing the devil. I'd asked you earlier, I don't know if you thought about it at all, if you had your own personal favorite performance of the devil in popular media popular culture yeah i tried to think about it and all i could think of was like a really dumb episode of star trek the next generation so i kind of came up blank (laughs) on this one what about you well which episode uh it's the one where there's a woman who's pretending to be the devil to like take over this planet that like believes in the devil so she assumes this role of being the devil of their planet in order to con them out of their mineral resources or something and i think it'd probably be a toss-up between the uh simpsons treehouse of horror episode where oh, yeah. we find out that ned ned flanders was the devil that's a good I found one that all pretty amusing and there's the trial for homer's soul yeah in a similar way <coughs> and then the the inspiration for all that um the devil and daniel webster the original movie from Oh, gosh, late 30s, early 40s, mm-hmm. where I think Walter Houston's performance of the devil is pretty iconic, pretty mm-hmm. entertaining. That's and cool. I I don't know, I don't want to accuse Burgess of cribbing or stealing, but there's definitely a parallel between those two performances. Yeah, I don't know what the plot of that movie is, but I noticed a couple of people comparing the two on IMDb. What, what's the plot of The Devil and Daniel Webster? Uh, Well, it's a classic American short story. It's about a farmer Mm -hmm. who is coming up on hard times and his land, nothing will grow. And the devil shows up, uh, Mm -hmm. I think, in like rural New Hampshire or something and offers basically in exchange for his soul. He'll give him riches and wealth. Gotcha. And the guy takes the deal and everything goes really well. And then the devil comes to collect. And being an American, instead of honoring his contract, he hires a lawyer Daniel Webster, Uh, who was one of the most famous uh, lawyers at the time, and they hold a trial in which Daniel Webster has to prove that the contract is null and void. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, John, if uh, your experience as as a lawyer (laughs) in the legal profession had offered any insight into how well that contract would hold up in court. You know, because Burgess Meredith does kind of get him to sign it under false pretense. Generally, you're charged with uh, reading 
what you sign. Mm -hmm. Preferably, the devil would have added a merger clause that would say something <laughs> to the effect of you're not relying on any other representations, you know, only the things in the agreement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Twilight we'll Legal the Twilight Bone <laughs> legal, legal Podcast. Legally, I think that the contract still stands. I don't see how making the devil get in a car accident has any effect on it. I think he's still bound by the terms of that yeah. agreement. That, that's Just the real twist he, of the episode is that guy's going right. to hell. <laughs> right. uh the twist of the episode i guess at the end is that he's able to use the linotype machine that's been doing evil yeah. he's able to use it for his own purposes to save the day it's not a classic twilight zone twist in that it doesn't really pull the rug out from underneath you it's it's kind of like a twist like you'd see in any episode of anything it's just like a right it's a like plot how mechanism does that, how does the hero right. you know save the girl it feels a little weird to rate it the same way that we'd rate other twists but like i don't right. know five or something would be my, my yeah favorite. i'd put it somewhere in the middle and then imdb gives this episode an 8.1 mm -hmm. so just a hair below walking distance oh okay sure. yeah. good old imdb it's hard because this episode is not bad by any means you know there's there's not right. much in it that's like outright bad people selling their soul to the devil to succeed those kinds of plots are a dime a dozen and something has to really stand out and i'm not sure that this one really stood out aside from burgess meredith's performance and some small touches so when i watched it the first time i thought it was enjoyable up mm -hmm. until about the halfway point and my interest just started waning and yeah. waning until it was over but i still would say it was you know overall pretty good and yeah. then i watched it again to pull clips and it just felt like pulling teeth like yeah. <laughs> through it again i'd known anecdotally that like oh the fourth season episodes are an hour long and maybe the show suffered for it so i went into it thinking like well maybe that's just like a you know, people are just being unfair, unfairly judging this. The fact that it's an hour long is, is really needless and it really kind of hurts the show because there's, so, there's only so much stuff that actually happens and then it's just like the constant repetition of the devil making bad stuff happen and people being upset about right. it is like kind of wears a little bit thin. So this is a, a an episode that I think really did suffer given the uh, hour-long format of the fourth season. If I had only watched it once, I think I would have maybe given it a five or six. Having watched it twice, mm -hmm. I think I'll give it a four. I mean, I think it's a little higher than that for me. I would say it's a six just because I really did like watching Burge go crazy and I thought some of the lines were pretty clever and fun. But it's like a, it's a week six. It's a six minus. Uh, we have another listener request next week. Eric wrote in a request to our Facebook page suggesting we do the episode, Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up? I think that's a third season episode. Yeah. People want to check it out on Netflix. Yeah. We'll be there. It'll be on Hulu. Listeners, we appreciate everyone who has been checking out the show. Tell your friends about it. Subscribe in iTunes if you haven't already. And if you could, we'd love if you'd leave a review. And you can email the show at twilightpwpw in at gmail.com and check out our tumblr where we add a bunch of pictures or just things we find related to the episodes we discuss and we're also available on stitcher which is a mobile internet radio platform finally we're on twitter at twilight pwn fred any other final thoughts about printer's devil no 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 <laughs> no, no no all right fred well i will talk to you next week sounds good bye bye all right bye